Whenever there's a murder, it's the job of detectives to find out who the killer is and how they killed. And often, it's forensic evidence which provides the clues. The finding of his DNA wasn't just on the murder weapon. It was on a most important part of the murder weapon. This evidence was the breakthrough that we needed. The forensic evidence in this case was crucial. In this series, we shine a light on how cutting-edge forensic techniques and the power of science brought the most dangerous killers to justice. A truly horrific criminal, a monster. It's a hammer blow. You don't know how you're going to carry on. We'll hear how some of the most disturbing crimes were solved thanks to the tiniest fragments of evidence. He basically said to me, she's in the house, go and find her. The amount of blood that was there indicated that there was a, a frenzied attack. There was no reasonable explanation for them. That's why he changed his plea. And how even the most forensically aware of killers couldn't beat the experts and hide their crimes. The key thing about having a DNA profile is you've got probably the sharpest tool in the box. I was so elated beforehand. We didn't have the evidence and all of a sudden we'd cracked it. In this episode, a tight-knit community of friendly neighbours discover why their friend has been missing. And they glanced through the, the bedroom door. They could see that her, her body was in the bed. Forensic evidence that can lead to only one conclusion. In the context of somebody tied up with an electrode fixed somewhere, like the toe, hinted at electrical torture. And a midnight call signalling one family's nightmare. I took Dad aside and, and told him that Lane was dead. This is Forensics, Catching the Killer. I was 14 at the time. I was living with my mum and dad. Dad was a fisherman and that, and I loved my school and my friends, so it's a sort of close community. And it was, it was just really nice to stay, live at the time, it was nice. In 1984, 14-year-old Nicola Scott was living with her family in the Scottish coastal town of Dunbar, less than 50 kilometers east of the capital Edinburgh. That night, I had been with my, my friends at the time, and I went home and nobody was in the house, and I thought, I'm quite peckish, you know? And the dog was there. Well, the dog comes everywhere with me. And we, we went up the street to the chip shop, which is in the main high street, and that's where I met him, outside the chip shop. The man she met was a family friend of Nicola's, and someone who both she and her parents trusted. So we went down the harbour, and I was going to go round, right round and then back to my house. And that's when he said to me, we walked down the harbour, past the castle pub, and then you go past the other pub, the Jersey, and he says, oh, Nicky, come and I'll show you the glass. At my house, he opened his door, and he says, come in and I'll show the glass. I just walked in, never thought anything. There was no lights. And then the next minute, I had a knife at my throat. I was petrified, I just started shaking. The dog was barking, and that's when he, 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 he told me he was going to kill my dog. And he sort of led me, I don't know if it was a living room, because the house was absolutely pitch black, about the smell. That's what I can mind, it was absolutely stinking. And he, 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 I still had the knife at my throat. And then he must have put me through, which was, I don't know if it was a bedroom, because I couldn't see at all. So he was just leading me. And he, he made me take my clothes off myself. And then he forced me on the bed, and that's when he tied, he must have had ropes. And that's when he tied me up. During the attack, Nicola was sexually assaulted and smothered. But being a fisherman, 
he knew all about the ropes, can they tie ropes and everything. He knew all about that. So when I was tied up, he tried to suffocate me two or three times with a pillow. That was horrible because I, could, I couldn't breathe. And I, when he was doing that, I thought, that's it, I'm, a, I'm gone. But he was quite shouting and violent, you know. And uh, at the time, I just kept saying, look, just let me go. I'll not tell anybody, you know, I'll not say nothing. It's, it's weird, the things that race through your mind, you know, at the time you're thinking, am I going to see my mum again? Or, I thought, this is it. I'm a ways, you know, got to let me out of here, I don't care what's going to happen, you know? But it was horrible. To her surprise, the attacker released Nicola. Still terrified, she made it to his front door and once outside, back towards her home. I didn't look behind, but I, I tried to look two or three times behind and I could see him following me, but I just thought, keep walking, just keep going. And then I went, when I got to the road end, which there's a garage, um, I thought, right, I'll have a quick look, and he had just disappeared. Once in the safety of her home, the teenager couldn't hide the terror of what she'd gone through. I told my dad everything. I burst into tears and my dad just got, got his clothes on and went out looking for him. And then I had a bath because I just felt absolutely disgusting. It was uh, degrading me, it just made me feel dirty. I just felt, oh, you know, somebody older than me that's, do you know that somebody that age can attack a young girl that I just couldn't believe somebody that I trusted could do that to my family. After my dad giving him a job and uh, being on the lifeboat and everything, he was well known about the community as well in the harbour and everybody got on with him as well, you know. It, I just couldn't take it in, you know. Unable to find the attacker, Nicola's father took her to local police to report the incident. But the man who assaulted her had fled Dunbar, and with a lack of evidence, no charge was ever brought. What did remain for Nicola was fear and trauma. I used to have nightmares for weeks. I used to have nightmares about it. It was terrible. I used to think, oh, he's got to come and get her. He's got to sit outside the house. Or... I never went to school for a wee while after it either. After that, he just totally disappeared, you know? It was crazy. Fifteen years later, and the man who attacked Nicola would resurface. It's April 1999, the location, one of Edinburgh's toughest housing estates. 1999, Muir House unfortunately had a really bad reputation as being a crime-ridden, socially deprived estate. Jane Hamilton was a journalism student in the Scottish capital. So there was a really vibrant community and there was a lot of, you know, community activism going on to try and better the area and a lot of good people lived there. It was that close-knit community who noticed that one of their neighbours, 46-year-old Elaine Colley, hadn't been seen around for a while. This was the Easter holiday weekend. And she was very, very friendly uh, with one lady uh, that lived nearby, very close, and one gentleman, uh, as in just purely a, a, a friendship with these people, but she saw them. So they got a wee bit concerned collectively that they hadn't seen her for a couple of days. Bert Swanson was the detective chief inspector on call at the city's Leith police station at the time. They are alert enough to realise that something is amiss here. It's been near four days, and we see this lady every day, and she's not said she's going away or anything. So they were, that was triggering something. And then they've come together eh, and said, can we look through the, the, the letterbox? And when they look through the letterbox the first time, the gentleman on his own, he, he has a look and he sees that the flower pot is over. But that in itself 
to him, something may have just toppled over as she's left. So that doesn't spark it. Uh, but he then gets in touch with this other lady who lives nearby, who's a very close friend of, of Elaine's. So when he relays that to her and says, hey, can you come up with me? And she's got a spare set of keys, so better still. So they go up and they then knock on the door and there's no reply, so they turn the key and they go in. And when they glance through the, the bedroom door, they could see that her, her body was in the bed and it's clear that she's dead and all is clearly not as it should be. On the 5th of April, 1999, police in Scotland had been called to the home of 46-year-old Elaine Colley on the Edinburgh housing estate of Muir House. Elaine's neighbors had found her dead in her home, having not been seen for a few days. Her closest family members, namely her brother, sister-in-law and nephew, were living in New Zealand. We received it, I think, possibly midnight, one o'clock New Zealand time, I'd, I'd just gone to bed. You're sort of waking up out of a stupor, effectively, and you just, you know, you just hear, you know, that Elaine's dead. I don't sort of recall too much in terms of what I was told. I, I certainly recall that it, um, we weren't given any sort of details that it was, um, that it was a murder. Um, and then it was a case of, of obviously getting, getting clothes on and, um, and going down um, to where my parents were and, and telling them, which was uh, exceptionally hard. Um, yeah, it was... My wife sort of went to, went to see my mother and I took Dad aside and, and told him that Lane was dead. Being so far away, there's a sense of slight disbelief, but, you know, also knowing that, that it must be true, so. As police began to investigate, they discovered a well-liked woman with cultural interests and who lived a happy, independent life. She was a legal secretary for most of her, her working life. Um, she loved arts, poetry, music, and she would visit her friend regularly because they lived just, you know, literally yards away from each other. Yeah, she was definitely well known, um, you know, and um, was well known at the local corner shop as well. Very, on very good, um, friendly terms with everyone. Um, you know, while she only had a sort of small group of friends, you know, um, just a, a lovely, quiet um, lady who sort of lived life on her terms. Somebody who was quite content in the life that she'd sort of um, made for herself and she loved Edinburgh to bits and I used to arrive in Edinburgh um, and nothing was ever too much trouble um, you know so you know I was I was in my early 20s and, and could look after myself but you know she'd make sure that she was at Waverley Station to meet me make sure that she'd come into um, you know come to see me off at Waverley Station and, and stuff like that so you know she really um, you know no, like I said, nothing was too much trouble for her. The task now was to determine how Elaine died. Crime scene investigator Tom Finney was one of the first to enter her flat. We were called here uh, regarding a suspicious death at that particular time. I went in, carried out a, a visual examination and uh, the first thing that struck me, there was an overturned pot plant in the hallway. There were some earth strewn along the hallway and also appeared to be drag marks in the carpet, along the carpet in the hallway. We entered the bedroom area and Elaine was lying in her bed, uh, duvet cover covering her. But uh, I started to note one or two items uh, on the bedroom floor. There's small pieces of... Uh, plastic lying uh, adjacent to the bed. There was a couple of smears of blood on the duvet cover. Uh, some uh, blue fibres were uh, also noted. 
And there were other small clues, which the forensic teams and detectives quickly became aware of. Looking closely at the bed itself, uh, I could see that uh, there was an electric blanket on the bed, but the cable was missing from the point of the control box, the switch, and it had the appearance that the cable had been cut. Uh, so there was a stretch missing and there was nothing in the socket. Uh, there was trousers which was in on the ground, uh, basically in a heap. And that in itself, you know, m makes you, you look at something. We're talking here, remember, about a person, you know, everything else that I had seen and observed was in keeping with this as a, a, a fastidious, a tidy person. But there's these things that's just slightly out of sync with that. The clues weren't just found in Elaine's bedroom. There were one or two items lying on the living room floor, included was a pair of uh, spectacles, uh, an unusual place, just almost lying in the, uh, you know, just on the floor. The rest of the house was very tidy. One or two drawers had been opened, one or two things lying on the floor, but she looked like she'd gone to bed. There was a cup of tea sitting on her bedside uh, cabinet. So by all intents and purposes, it looked like she'd just gone to bed. Uh, and obviously it's just come to some, you know, uh, natural death. But the gut reaction, there is obviously something going on in, in that scene that is not normal. There's too many factors starting to add up. So the, the team, the forensic team, start to obviously formulate a, you know, a feel for the whole thing. And at that stage, we thought we were dealing with a homicide. Realising this might be a suspicious death. Pathologist Basil Perdue was called to the flat to make his initial assessment and preserve forensic evidence before Elaine's body was moved. There was a lot of bruising on the arms, and it had band like bruising around both wrists, or at least part way around both wrists. For practical purposes, you can't bruise a dead body. It's not something that's happened after death. These bruises have happened while Elaine was alive, and it suggests she may well have been manhandled. And that tended to support the idea that she'd quite possibly been tied up or restrained in some way with ligatures, in other words, bindings of some kind. While some things remained unclear, the pathologist team were able to provide other answers. They weren't able clearly to give a, a definitive cause of death because of the state of the decomposition. But they were clear here that uh, there was what appeared to be two uh, blunt trauma injuries to the head. And it also transpired that Elaine had been subjected to a terrible sexual assault. But the most shocking discovery of all was so tiny it could very easily have been missed. There was a particular mark which caught my interest very strongly indeed, which was a mark on the inside of the right little toe. And what it was, was on the back of the toe, it was three millimetres in width, and it was about half an inch, 1.2 centimetres in length. And looking at it, I thought it might be an electric mark. When electricity comes into contact with human skin, it can leave distinctive markings. Now, we were looking at a body that was decomposing, which makes things difficult. And uh, I still felt that we ought to treat this as an electric mark because I was highly suspicious of it. It's a very strange place to see a mark of that sort, and it was partly encircling the toe. Skin samples were taken from Elaine's toe and sent to the laboratory for further testing, and the results were even more surprising. So we'd found heat coagulation and copper deposits on the skin. The preservative fluid we use uh, to prepare the skin to be able to examine it ourselves doesn't contain copper, so it can't have come from there. The human body itself contains only infinitesimal amounts of copper. You do need to, a little tiny bit of it, but not enough to have a, a deposit of this size in the skin. So it has to be 
something that's come from outside. It's got to be extraneous copper. If you wrap a, a wire around your finger or any other part of your body, it doesn't deposit enough copper to be detected. It simply can't be picked up, it is just too little. However, if it's a live conductor at mains voltage, then it will deposit copper. So our findings strongly suggested to us that what we were dealing with was a live conductor wrapped around the right little toe and acting as a static electrode. As the pathologists and detectives realised, this could mean only one thing. One uses um, the word torture very sparingly, if at all, in autopsies, but in the context of somebody tied up with an electrode fixed somewhere, like the toe, and another one capable of being applied to different bits of the body, we said it hinted at electrical torture. In April 1999, police in Edinburgh had found the body of a 46-year-old woman, Elaine Colley, in bed in her flat. She had suffered blunt force trauma to her head and had been sexually assaulted. But most terrifying of all were signs that Elaine had been tortured with electrocution using the cable from an electric blanket. Detectives knew there was a killer on the loose and the local community wondered if that person was in their midst. We had got word that there had been a murder not far from where we were studying, so of course, you know, the, um, everybody was a bit frightened because this was a, an unusual murder. Um, it wasn't to do with drugs and it wasn't a domestic, so it was, you know, it caused a bit of a, a stir because, you know, people were wondering, oh my goodness, what's happened? You know, um, is there a serial killer on the loose? It was very quickly, you know, there were rumours that, um, you know, somebody was going about massacring young women. But how could someone living in a highly populated housing estate have been tortured and murdered in her own home with neighbours and other flats surrounding her on all sides? It was uh, a block, and from memory, Scots had had 16 flats, so... I think it's four on each level. It is a, a standard, a common stair that gives access to each of those. Now, although there were 16 flats, they weren't all occupied. The people there and in that area, to be perfectly honest, tended to keep themselves to themselves. So it was not unusual. Nobody actually heard anything. With no vital information from neighbours, detectives would now rely on forensic evidence collected from Elaine's home to help identify who might have tortured and then killed her. We carried out an examination of the spectacles recovered from the living room area uh, back in the identification branch, and we found a fingerprint on the lens of one of the, uh, one of the lenses of the spectacles. That fingerprint would obviously be uh, compared against Elaine Colley's fingerprints to eliminate, because quite possibly could be hers, but in this particular instance, it wasn't Elaine. So there was a very good chance whoever had assaulted her, it could be their fingerprint. Elaine's glasses weren't the only place where key fingerprints were found. We also found a set of prints low down on the bedroom door, and that led into where Elaine had been recovered, body had been recovered. The supposition was that she had possibly been, been dragged through the hallway, and when she entered into the bedroom area, she possibly grabbed out and tried to hold to stop herself being dragged uh, and held onto the bedroom door. And that clearly is supposition, but having fingerprints that low down on the bedroom door tended to indicate that it wasn't a natural position for the fingerprints to be in. Elaine's highly organised life and home would yield much of the information DCI Bert Swanson's team would need in piecing together her last movements. The main house keys was missing. Uh, there was no, no keys. Now, you know, when we were chatting and getting statements from people, we know that she came in just before four o'clock on this particular day. So she obviously had to, her keys to get into the house. 
So where are they? The good thing about Elaine in this particular case was the fact that she, she was a very a meticulous person, a very tidy person. She had worked in an accountant's office, I believe she worked for solicitors at one stage and that, so all her records and that was very, very good. So when it comes to banking information, for instance, we were able to find uh, information from her files that would still be there. So that at least leads us straight into the bank. And in this particular case, from that process, we found that there was two bank cards missing. That account was accessed. And the good thing then was that we were in the stage where the ATMs were having the camera. Not the best quality, I should add, but you were getting okay, some footage as well. And other records provided yet more vital clues that detectives needed. They checked her telephone to see where the last phone call was made to. It led them to a house about a mile and a half away from where Elaine actually lived. The house belonged to a woman, and police officers visited this woman to speak to her to ascertain what the phone call was about and how she knew Elaine Colley. During the course of that interview, it then emerged that the woman actually lived with a man, and that man was John Jock Reed. Now, police needed to understand just who was John or Jock Reed and what was his connection to Elaine. So John Jock Reed was um, originally from Dunbar in East Lothian. He didn't live specifically in Muir House, he lived in West Granton, which was about a mile and a half away from Muir House. He had an extensive criminal record, um, mostly for drunken behaviour, assaults and petty theft. He'd been in and out of prison for various things, but nothing what we would regard as being serious. But it soon emerged that Reid had a very strong alibi. He was arrested the same night as Elaine's death. They, in fact, arrested him for being drunk and incapable. He's been sentenced the following morning, uh, on the Saturday morning, to four months in prison, so he's incarcerated in Sorkin Prison. So there's no immediate danger to any other person here, whilst we loosely regard him as our strong suspect at this stage. We're learning, of course, about him, and we're learning that, where he lives, with his girlfriend, and from the girlfriend, we learn of the existence of this other flat. He actually had a flat adjacent to Elaine's on the same landing, obviously, uh, and he used this as more of a postal drop. It was not really a, a flat that had been lived in. After securing a warrant, detectives and forensic investigators gained entry to this other apartment. One of those present was forensic scientist Shirley Marshall. The property, although it was very busy, there was, there was lots of uh, furniture and lots of electrical equipment and bits of, of debris around which looked as if the person was into DIY or like an, an electrician type of a uh, workshop type thing. What we try and do as forensic scientists is to be able to, to create links between things. Elaine um, was found in, 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 in a bed. On that bed there were wooden posts and we know that there were shards or, or pieces of, of fibres found behind the bed that appeared to be like blue poly polypropylene type rope. And then, subsequently, blue rope was found in Reed's property. We then um, had to take advice on the knot examination because there were knots in the rope and the rope was actually quite expertly spliced, which is something you don't see very often. In order to get that advice, DCI Bert Swanson brought in an expert knot and rope specialist. He explained, and what he said was that, to me, this is the type of knot that I would associate with uh, someone who's uh, a 
fisherman or has knowledge of working on the, the sea would be using this type of head. And in addition to all of that, clearly we're looking at the background of who we're looking at. And indeed, lo and behold, we find that the person that we have in now as a strong suspect it did in fact work on a fishing boat. Back in the lab, Shirley Marshall was able to examine the rope further. We did a, a microscopic examination under a low-power microscope to, to look for blood and um, traces of skin. Because if someone is bound with rope, then they tend to potentially get small pieces of skin trapped in it or surface uh, uh, rubbed off. And we did find some areas that, that appeared to be skin and also blood, um, which were DNA tested and matched back to Elaine. We did observe blood staining on the bedding and blood staining on Elaine's clothing that uh, was being worn at the time. Um, so we knew that there was the potential there for blood to be transferred to the, to the assailant. And surprisingly, Reed being incarcerated assisted the forensic investigation. So we were also in the situation where um, he was in prison. He'd been uh, arrested on the, the Friday of that bank holiday weekend and his clothing was seized at that time. So we were able to look at his clothing that he was wearing on the Friday. Um, blood staining was found on the front of his jacket and also on his jeans. And more connections to the crime were being discovered in Reed's flat, notably a cable for an electric blanket. Two officers had been sent down to the electric blanket factory um, in the north of England, um, and they were actually on a phone call to the murder um, team with information from the factory about what the plug might look like from that electric blanket. So they were already looking for intelligence information in order to try and link that flex with the plug potentially to um, Elaine's electric blanket to see whether that had been removed from the crime scene and into uh, Reed's property next door. I was involved in the examination of the cable for, for blood. Um, which we did find, and that matched back to Elaine. So the cable with the plug attached that was found in Reed's property um, could be linked to um, matching the DNA profile of Elaine um, and therefore linked back to her property. But also the identification branch looked very closely for... There were a number of small pieces of the white cable from the electric blanket were found in Elaine's property, but also a key piece was found on the floor of Reed's, Reed's flat, um, if I remember rightly, between the kitchen and the, the lounge. Um, and that became really key in being able to put a physical fit together to um, link that flex to the electric blanket next door. Once again, items recovered during Reed's arrest would provide further evidence against him. Looked at the video evidence from the police station, which there was in place at that time, uh, the way in which he was processed. Uh, and in that, I could see that he was emptied his belongings, his po pockets onto that, and he had amongst other things, a set of keys. And one of the sets of keys, he, the officer picked it up and says, is that an E on that, what's that? And they never replied. And the officer didn't say anything further, just put it back in the property. So again, I go to Sochton Prison, check that his property is there, what's happened to his property since he's been inside, and the set of keys were still there. Took possession of the set of keys from the prison, took it down to the, the flat at Muir House and uh, one set opened the door of Elaine Colley, the deceased flat, and the other set opened the door of the accused flat next door. In April 1999, police in Edinburgh were investigating the murder of 46-year-old Elaine Colley. She had been found dead in her bed in the city's Muehlhaus area. Pathologists have found signs 
a blunt force trauma, sexual assault, and torture by electrocution using an electric blanket. Detectives and crime scene investigators had found a wealth of evidence in Elaine's flat and that of her neighbor, who was now the main suspect, John Jock Reed. Fortuitously, he was already in custody, having been arrested for offenses, including being drunk and incapable on the day of Elaine's murder. We were informed by the major incident team that a suspect had come into the frame. When a comparison was carried out at a later date, we found a match for a thumbprint belonging to John Reed, which was great evidence because it placed John Reed in the flat handling the spectacles at some time. The positive identification of these prints, along with forensic evidence found on the rope used to tie Elaine's wrist, the electrocution blanket, and images from a nearby ATM machine, all helped detectives to piece together how the murder happened and possibly why. Earlier in the day, he'd spoke to somebody who says, you owe me a hundred pound. So it was wheeling and dealing in old cars. And at that stage, she says, I don't have the money. He said, well, you have to get the money. So there was words exchanged. Now that became significant because he had said and given assurance to the guy, look, I'll get the money. So that's the same day as Elaine died. We know that Elaine went into her flat roughly about four o'clock because immediately after that, at 11 minutes, I think it was past four, there was a phone call from her flat to what turns out to be the uh, girlfriend of the accused. Elaine's killer had actually knocked on her door and asked if he could use her phone to make an emergency phone call. And because she had probably seen him in the passing, you know, more than once, he wasn't a stranger to her, although she wasn't friendly with him, she knew his face to say hello to, so that there wouldn't have been any alarm or any um, sense of danger when Elaine answered the door to her killer that night. DCI Bert Swanson had Reed brought from the prison where he was being held to Leith Police Station for questioning. He admitted that he had gone into the flat to use the phone. He then said that he had come away from that and that he had got himself blind drunk and that he, the rest is a blank to him. He knows nothing else about it. That it's very rare for them to actually give you a confession at that stage or to admit to any wrongdoing. And that's what happened here. So it wasn't a surprise to us, but equally, there was a sufficiency of evidence for us to do what we were doing. So therefore, we knew he was the guilty party at that time. Reed was charged with the murder of Elaine Colley on the 21st of April, 1999, just 16 days after her body was found. Presented with the overwhelming evidence against him, he pleaded guilty to her murder and to stealing 350 pounds from her. Elaine's family traveled from New Zealand to attend the hearing held at the Edinburgh High Court later that year. My father, my mother and I came back over for um, the, the court hearing and we knew it was, it was gonna be a guilty plea and, and sentencing. The accused himself he had really nothing to say there. He had admitted that he was who he is, that's, and that's all he's asked for. He's not asked for an explanation at this juncture in the court proceedings. It's beyond that. So he's there for the sentence, and that's what happened to him. Reed was sentenced uh, a month later. Um, he was given a life sentence with a minimum um, prison sentence of 15 years before he could apply for parole. But the murder and torture of Elaine wasn't Reed's only crime which came to light. There were other attacks and victims, some from many years earlier. He had been accused of three further sex attacks in the past. Um, when he left on bar, it emerged that he actually didn't leave of his own volition. He was actually run out of town 
because he had been accused of trying to rape a 14-year-old girl. The second sex attack that Reid was accused of was an attempt to rape a woman in a graveyard and the only reason that he was unsuccessful was the woman's screams attracted um, passers-by and they chased him off. The third sex attack was on a male um, who he uh, attempted to attack at a bus stop and was unsuccessful because the man managed to fight him off. One of those previous victims, Nicola, was at home when police came to visit her, 15 years after she had been attacked. I just said, do you know Jock Reid? I said, yes. What can I do? Uh, could we speak to you? And when they told me, I was just, I couldn't believe it. I said, I do not believe he's murdered somebody. When I phoned my dad, I said, you're not going to believe this, he's murdered somebody, Dad. I said, that could have been me. The forensic evidence in this case was crucial. So many elements, so many different parts of forensic science kind of overlap. I think there were about eight different scientific reports, lots of different experts involved. I mean, it is overwhelming. John Reid died of COVID in 2021, while he was still incarcerated. One question remained unanswered and went with him to his grave. Why he killed Elaine for just a few hundred pounds. Some of it is cruel beyond belief, uh, but it's a tragedy, it's a tragedy, it's an unnecessary tragedy for for anybody and everybody. I mean, if money was all he was seeking and needing here, he could have got money. He could have got the money. He could have got the cards. He could have achieved what he set out to do. So you have to say that he wanted more than just money. But for Elaine's family, there were no answers as to why Reed had chosen her, and nor will there ever be. She was a gentle, quiet person who lived her life as she wanted to. And what Reid did to Elaine has left a deep scar on my father. You know, he's her big brother. What she went through was horrific. Um, she suffered horrendous physical and mental terror over a sustained period of time. And, you know, um, you know, like any family member, um, you know, it, it's an impossible thing, but you wish that there was something you could have done to have changed it. I don't think we'll ever be able to get over it. You know, what are we, um, 23 years since it happened? And it still, still hurts, you know. People say that the time's a great healer, um, but, you know, when you, when you actually think of what went on, um, it is very difficult to, to still stay composed about. Next, and this is all this, uh, uh, fat, funny stones, uh, 
Schrobi af, hyldt med mig, sagde. Og hvor gik du ud den nok? 
Yes, <laughs> 